I, I'm pretty old. I, I began this about 40 years ago, this journey. And I, I do have a PhD in family therapy, marital and family therapy. And I was one of those obnoxious family therapists who thought we'd found the Holy Grail and that people who were exploring the in, in, intrapsychic world were wasting their time because we could change all that by just reorganizing families and <clears throat> did an outcome study to prove that and found that we couldn't do that. We, and it was actually an outcome study with uh, bulimia, which is the actual, the client I'm going to show later in the video has that problem. And so as my clients didn't get better, I started asking why, and they started to teach this to me. Uh, and that was about, I, mean, I think this next year, it's going to be 40 years. Uh, and they started talking about what they called parts of them that were surrounding their symptoms and would say, for example, when something bad happened in their life, it would trigger this critic who would call them all kinds of brutal names. And then that would bring in a part that could make them feel totally worthless and alone and empty and young, like a child. And that part was so distressing to feel that the binge would come in to take them away from it. But then the act of the binge would bring back the critic, who's now calling him a pig on top of the other names. And that, of course, would bring back that part that could make them feel so empty and alone and worthless. So then the binge would have to come back and they'd be caught up in that vicious cycle for days. And as I listened to that, it reminded me of what I'd been studying in families, which are these circular sequences of interaction that escalate over time and that, that feed off of each other. <clears throat> so I began to try and apply some family therapy technique to the inner system of these, these uh, bulimic kids. And, but at the time I was making the mistake that most of the field still makes, unfortunately, which is to assume these parts were the way they seemed. So the critic was some kind of internalized parental voice and the binge was an out of control impulse. And when you think of them that way, you try to get your client to argue with the critic or to control the binge. And that was making it worse, but I didn't know what else to do. And then I had a client who, uh, in addition to the binging and purging, cut herself on her wrist. And that was driving me crazy. And I'd heard about the Gestalt open chair technique or empty chair technique. I don't know if you know about it, but you could have a client sit in one chair and talk to an empty chair as if that part of them was in that chair and I and then have them be that part talking back. And so I was doing that with these parts. And on one session, I decided I wouldn't let the, uh, the client go until that cutting part had agreed not to do it to her that week. And after uh, a couple hours of me badgering the part and her badgering the part, it finally said it wouldn't cut her. And I opened the door to the next session and she's got a big gash down the side of her face. And I spontaneously collapsed emotionally and just came out with, I give up, I can't beat you at this. And the part said, you know, I don't really want to beat you. And that was a turning point in the history of this work because I shifted out of that coercive part to just being curious, then why do you do this to her? And the part talked about how when she was being abused as a child, it needed to get her out of her body and it needed to contain the rage that would get her more abuse. And with that, I shifted myself more. And now I just felt kind of a appreciation for the heroic role it played in her life. It literally saved her life. And I could convey that to the part. And it broke into tears because everyone had demonized it and tried to get rid of it. Finally, somebody was listening to it. <clears throat> and so I tried the same thing with a bunch of other clients, some of them bulimic and some of them not, many of them addicted. And I would have that similar conversation with the addicted part. And to my amazement, these parts would all share their secret histories of how they were forced into these roles and that they really were trying to protect the client uh, and, and make them get away from the feelings that the client was so scared of. And so after 
a while, I started to conclude that maybe I had made a big mistake. Maybe these parts aren't what they seem. And that indeed, now 40 years later, is true. And I just wrote a book called No Bad Parts because after working with parts that had uh, have done horrible, horrible things, uh, and getting to those parts and hearing their secret histories, you learn that they're all frozen in time, often during traumas when you were young. Ah, there's the book. <laughs> and uh, yes, Daisy, is it? Yeah, thanks for holding up the book. Um, they're all frozen in time. They think you're five years old still, maybe. They think that they have to protect you in the way they did back then. They, from those trauma experiences, carry extreme beliefs and emotions that we call burdens. So they're, the basic idea is that it's the natural state of the mind to be multiple, that we're born that way, to have what I call parts. Other systems call them ego states or things like that, subpersonalities. They're all valuable. There are no bad parts. We wouldn't be born with anything uh, that wouldn't be helpful in our lives. But trauma and attachment injuries, bad parenting, force them out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be quite damaging. And as I said, freeze them in time during the trauma so they think they still have to do it and then burden them with these extreme beliefs and emotions that drive the way they operate almost like a virus, like the coronavirus that infects the part and, and keeps it in those extreme states. And so uh, that's one fundamental uh, principle of IFS, no bad parts, everybody's got them. People with what used to be called multiple personality disorder are no different from anybody else, except that theirs got blown apart a lot more, what are called uh, alters in MPD or DID, are the same phenomenon I'm talking about that everybody has. It's just that because they, of the horrific abuse they suffered, theirs have these amnesic barriers between them and they're they're a lot more polarized and so on, but it's the same phenomena. So this is a kind of radically different perspective on human nature, on uh, psychotho psychotherapy, on uh, psychopathology, very normalizing, depathologizing approach. So that's parts. And being a systems guy, I was interested in how these parts operated, not just individually, but how they related to each other as a system. And, uh, you know, in families, we would try to fix, watch for patterns and see what kind of uh, patterns that, that, that we could discern. And the patterns that leaped out and, and the distinctions that leaped out immediately to me with this inner system are between the parts that you might call inner children who are young and innocent often and before they're hurt give us all kinds of fun qualities like playfulness and creativity and a kind of love of life and innocence and but once and, and they're the most sensitive parts because they are sort of like young children but and so when you get traumatized or hurt they're the ones that get hurt the most and so they are they take on the burdens of worthlessness, for example, or terror from the trauma or emotional pain. And once they start to carry those burdens, they have the power to overwhelm us with those feelings and pull us back into those scenes. And so we try to lock them away. We try to get away from all of that. And everybody around us tells us to just let it go. Don't look back just move on. And so we wind up what in my language, exiling those parts of us, just because they got hurt, or terrified, locking them in inner basements or abysses, and trying our best after that to stay away from those feelings, not realizing 
thinking we're just moving on from the memories, sensations, emotions, and beliefs, not realizing we're disconnecting from our most precious qualities often. So those are what I call exiles. And when you get a lot of exiles, you feel a lot more delicate, the world seems a lot more dangerous because so many things could trigger them. And if they get triggered, it's like an explosion of emotion, explosion of raw flames that can overwhelm you, can consume you, and bring you back into those, those terrifying scenes. So other parts are forced out of their naturally valuable states to become what we call protectors. And some of them are trying to protect these exiles by managing your life so that no one gets close enough to trigger them or you look perfect so nobody rejects you or you perform at a really high level. And so you get accolades to counter the worthlessness, for example, or you take care of everybody so that everyone depends on you and likes you, or there's a whole bunch of, of what we call manager roles. So parts that keep you in your head, for example, and, and make you think rather than feel all the time and so on and so on. There's just lots of common manager roles. And again, this, these aren't the essence of these parts. They're the roles these parts were forced into to protect you. And, and again, many of these protectors and managers are frozen back in those traumas as well. <clears throat> so managers try their best. And a lot of times it succeeds and you don't get triggered and you have a decent life. But there are times that you do get triggered despite their best efforts. So these flames of emotions erupt out of your gut or wherever you've got them, and you feel like you're five years old in that scene again. And so there's another set of parts who are kind of on standby. And when you get triggered, they immediately go into action to deal with this emergency, to, to either get you higher than the flames of emotion or douse them with some substance or distract you until they burn themselves out. And these, what we call firefighter protectors, uh, don't care about the consequences. They don't care about the collateral damage to your body or to your relationships. They just know if they don't do their job, you're going to die. That's what they believe often. So they'll do whatever it takes to get you away from that exiled pain. So that, uh, that's the map. It's pretty simple. We've got these young exiled parts that carry all these intense burdens like worthlessness, which is terrifying. If you feel like you're not valued, you, you know you're going to die. So, uh, or this extreme terror or extreme emotional pain, sense of abandonment, things like that. That's what exiles typically carry. And then we have managers, one set of protectors, and then firefighters. And the managers and firefighters, even though they're both trying to contain and protect the exiles, are often polarized with each other. They're fighting each other about how best to do that. So if you have an addiction, it's often began as a firefighter to get you away from an exile. But the manager who likes to be in control all the time and please everybody is furious with the firefighter for taking you out of control and pissing everybody off. And so it's attacking you for having had the addiction or doing the addictive episode. <clears throat> and, and then that attack, that criticism from the manager, you know, you've heard of these inner critics. Well, often they're criticizing you because you're doing things they don't like or that take you out of control. That criticism, that shaming, self-shame, goes right to the heart of the exile, and, and the exile feels even worse. And so the firefighter has to do even more of its job. And you get that vicious cycle going that I described with the bulimics. So again, that's the map, very simple uh, in describing it. It gets complicated as you try to apply it. There's one more very important piece that I haven't talked about yet.